So today I'm talking about the therapeutic potential of ayahuasca for people with bipolar disorder. And these are preclinical investigations, which means, sorry, before you get too excited, no, I'm not dosing anyone in, in my PhD. So this uh, presentation carries on from the 2015 Breaking Convention uh, paper I did. Now, uh, so that if you want to get a more of a general introduction about bipolar disorder or more about my personal story, <laughs> then you can look at this uh, Vimeo online video of, from 2015. So firstly, I'm just going to talk in summary about bipolar disorder. So some of the essential characteristics of people with bipolar disorder. Now, all bipolar people have hypersensitive nervous systems, which means they have hypersensitive emotional reactions to life situations and also hypersensitive reactions to all psychoactive substances. They're easily traumatized and with the manic depressive mood swings, depression is more of a problem more of a time than mania. Now there's also a in statistical increased likelihood of having an exuberant personality, of having hyperperceptive spiritual awareness and of creative ability. Now those are the the good side of bipolar disorder. But there's a massively increased risk of suicide with bipolar people. And uh, paradoxically, they have, tend to have a bad response to antidepressant drugs. So for example, a bipolar person, your average bipolar person, if they take Prozac or St. John's wort, it either doesn't work or if it does anything, it overstimulates their nervous system into manic uh, symptoms. Now what seems to be going on is it's a genetic condition that involves a lack of a stabilizing mechanism. So your average brain, your neurotypical person, has a built-in stabilizing mechanism which balances, rebalances the brain when it's stimulated, when it gets excited or really happy or high, or if it gets sedated or sad then the average brain will rebalance itself. But the bipolar brain gets overstimulated or oversedated into mania and depression. So it's probably very, very likely a genetically determined condition which is exacerbated by life situations and drugs. Uh, but in this excellent documentary, Stephen Fry interviewed a whole bunch of bipolar people and asked them if they all in all could if they could, would they turn the gene off? And they all said no. So here's some people with bipolar disorder that you've probably heard of. Now, in all cases, their lives were plagued by the manic depressive mood swings. And in all cases, they either committed suicide or died of a, some kind of drug overdose that was an attempt, in an attempt to manage their condition. So this is like a really serious problem that I hope you can relate to here through these people. And um, but the thing is that there's a flip side, there's the creativity. So it's this sort of personality type that I'm particularly speaking to today. Now, people like this, the most valuable thing in their life is their creativity, their sensitivity, their spiritual awareness and so on. So, the problem is that the currently available pharmaceutical drugs, um, they may take out, they may limit the extremes of manic depression, but at the expense of the best things, at the expense of creativity, sensitivity, emotional sen um, awareness, and spiritual awareness, and so on. So people like this just tend to refuse to take the drugs. Now, the drugs that are currently on offer by the pharmaceutical industry. Now what about if a plant medicine came along that could help? Well, who here has an awareness of or heard an anecdote about the antidepressant benefits of ayahuasca? Right, that's just about everybody. Now so the... and change it back. And uh, so we have a tea from the Amazon that's been safety tested for thousands of years, probably, from, made from the vine of Banisteropsis carpi and the leaves of Psychotria viridis. So it's pretty well considered an antidepressant, Santa Medicina. 
Now, we can say that now with a lot more confidence thanks to the work of a bunch of Brazilian scientists, led by Professor Draulio Barros de Arroja, um, who has not got this published yet, but at the Psychedelic Science Conference in California this year, he, he showed his results. You can watch the YouTube, this link down the bottom here. It's strongly suggested with the proper scientific double-blind placebo-controlled experiments that it works as an antidepressant. So, could it work for bipolar disorder? Well, the current expert advice is no. Whatever you do, don't give bipolar disorder, uh, don't give ayahuasca to people with bipolar disorder. So if you ask, ask your average psychedelic science scientist, your average um, ayahuasca ceremony facilitator, or expert in the field, or if you ask your average psychiatrist, they would all say ayahuasca is dangerous for people with bipolar disorder because there's a risk of the manic depressive mood swings getting worse. Now, this is based on some real experience. For example, this documented case. There are some documented cases where people, after ayahuasca ceremonies, go manic, and then that might then lead to a suicidal phase and so on. So there's real life uh, reason for these concerns, and I got to, uh, you know, I got to acknowledge I agree with the place that all these experts are coming from. It's a duty of care thing where they're saying, uh, we don't want to do any harm to bipolar people, and they're at great risk. Now, what I would say in, return to, in response to that is that doing nothing is of great risk to people with bipolar disorder because of the suicide risk. Now, this PhD research started with my own personal story. So this is a self-portrait. I've got bipolar disorder. It's played havoc in my life. I've had the whole story. I've been suicidal for many months of my life. I've been locked up in hospital and uh, the whole deal that you've probably heard of before. Now, I had what was called a treatment-resistant case. I spent a decade in the psychiatric system and I was prescribed 17 different pharmaceutical drugs in order to try to fix my brain. And you know what? They just overall, would, I would say, made things worse. To be fair, lithium and lamotrigine were somewhat helpful, but by and large, the side effects were worse than the benefits, and they ruined my creativity and all the rest of it. I also tried a whole bunch of different herbs from Chinese doctors and naturopaths. They had the same sorts of problems. And then about 10 years ago, I discovered ayahuasca. And ever since, I've been off pharmaceutical drugs and managing my bipolar condition. And nowadays, the only psychoactive substance that I take in the world, I'm doing this as a bit of an experiment, just to prove my point, that nothing else is in the mix other than ayahuasca. So the only psychoactive substance that I take is ayahuasca, or I should say a particular brew of ayahuasca. Now, and the results of this is that I, uh, I experience what I call a humble happiness uh, without triggering mania, without the huge ego that often goes along with bipolar disorder. So then uh, I, I read about Kay um, Griffiths, an author with bipolar disorder who's had positive ayahuasca experiences. And then I met a whole bunch of other people in ceremonies and they were having positive results too. So I enrolled in a PhD in a psychiatry department and for the last couple of years, I've been doing um, all sorts of research, including a bunch of qualitative um, interviews and so on. And OK, I'm going to cut straight to some results. So in this sample of 50 people with bipolar disorder that have drunk ayahuasca, it's looking pretty good. So <coughs> now this is a really simple question. I'm not talking about spirituality here. I'm not talking, you know, about all the complexities. I'm just focusing on this really simple point. We know that Prozac, St. John's Wort and so on, trigger mania in bipolar people. So the question is, does ayahuasca work as an antidepressant without triggering mania? Now, 30, 30 of the 50 people have had entirely positive experiences with ayahuasca. 14 have had negative experiences entirely, and then six 
have been variable depending on the set and setting of the ceremony and other times they have a, a good or bad experience with different settings and different brews. Now, but I started to analyze these things and what I noticed is that actually there's what I would call a lot of false negatives. So, for example, uh, three of the negative examples were people that had done multiple ceremonies in a row and had uh, in, in, in consecutive nights and by the third or fourth night they hadn't had any sleep and they'd had lots of ayahuasca building up in the system so they've gone manic. Okay? Then you've got a whole bunch of chemical interactions with contraindicated substances. So, for example, three people going manic when uh, they've drunk ayahuasca one night and the next day they take some San Pedro mescaline cactus on top of that with the MAOI still in their system. Similar thing of a guy in Australia took mushrooms the morning after ayahuasca, went manic, and um, three or four people, the same story, either going manic or depressed, mixing marijuana with ayahuasca. Um, and also hape, the snuff, which is made of high nicotine tobacco, which is up the nose. So that's a tradition in some cases, but what, there are some people that, for example, they were had a, having a good experience just with the ayahuasca, and then someone came in along with hape up their nose, and they went totally, whoa, freaked out, and then they were really depressed. Right? So these are the chemical interactions. I would call those false negatives to the question, does ayahuasca work for bipolar people? However, there, there are still negatives just in this ayahuasca on its own. So I've been looking into those. Um, now, but what about the ayahuasca? Now, hang on a minute. A lot of people, I don't know if you realize this, but a lot of people in Europe who are drinking ayahuasca are in fact drinking fermented ayahuasca that's been in the post for a few weeks and then someone's facilitator is carrying around unrefrigerated and it's turning into alcohol. Uh, now, so that's a bit of a an issue as well that I've noticed. So for example, a guy that he did a ceremony once and he was all good and then two months later he did the same ceremony with the same batch of tea and the only difference was that it had fermented for a couple months and he got depressed after the second time. Yeah? So, what's going on? Well, there are these things called MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, in the tea which we know chemically interact with other psychoactive substances. So, for example, if you get meclobamide, which is an MAOI pharmaceutical antidepressant, it warns about mixing it with this other stuff. So that's an explanation of what's going on, or if there's too much of it, then that can overstimulate. It seems to me that what's going on is that the MAOIs are more of a problem for bipolar than the DMT. And uh, so, by the way, um, uh, with Chang'e, I think for bipolar people it's safer <coughs> to have pure DMT or, for example, an acacia crystal rather than mixing it with MAOI herbs. That's the experience that I've heard. Now, um, fermented ayahuasca, as I said, contains a certain amount of alcohol. I've got to work around any facilitators that one I can explain how to fix this problem. Uh, and now what I've done is I've developed a whole bunch of health and safety warnings. So now I've got to say, I'm not recommending that bipolar people drink ayahuasca, but I know that it's happening. And so what I'd like is, what I'm doing is I'm providing all these negative bad news reports and saying, please, if you're going to drink ayahuasca, don't do the same mistakes that other people have got. And if you want, there's a printout with all the details here. So basically, the main thing is mixing ayahuasca with other psychoactive substances, whether they're antidepressants, or tobacco, or um, you know the, the psychedelics, or even caffeine, or even chocolate. These things have a big effect in a bipolar system when mixed with ayahuasca. Um, I also have found that people making, drinking uh, bipolar people drinking uh, an ayahuasca analog made from Syrian rue uh, is more of a problem. And so I'm trying to figure that out why. So, now at this point I just want to acknowledge Mestre Irineo. So he was the founder of the Brazilian ayahuasca religion called Santo Daime, 
And um, from the 1920s until the 1970s, he did a lot of experimentation. And I would, I, I'm acknowledging him not only as a spiritual master, but also as a genius scientist, because he figured out which is the best subspecies. He, he liked to use Jagubi or Inyo. And he figured out how to cut the vine, the perfect ratio of vine to leaf, and the temperature used a particular type of wood, and all these factors. Yeah, and lo and behold, when I went to his original church where his widow Peregrina is maintaining the tradition perfectly, the brew was perfect for me. Now, so as I say, there's all these different subspecies of the Banisteriopsis carpi vine. Question is, you know, is there going to be one which is better or worse for bipolar people? Well, if anything, it seems that the yellow and the orinho are better and the black is more of a problem, but that's a very, very rough guesstimate at this point in time. I went and I asked all these uh, facilitators, including this expert from the Huni Quinn tribe, Padre Du Boussin, I asked him the, uh, basically what was best. And he talked about the Shawa Huni, the Tuku Huni, the Chupa Huni, and he talked about you know, the, the fish one, the monkey one, the singing bird one, and all this stuff but I couldn't get like an answer to my question. So I, <laughs> the, uh, so I've reverted to scientific um, reductionist uh, analysis. Now, people like Calloway and McKenna have done a whole bunch of analyses of different brews. So they've gone to different churches and different tribes and picked up things and put them through uh, analyses and come up with all these different ingredients. Now, the ratios of these four psychoactive ingredients. Now, these, they are from the vine, harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydrohamine, the harmala alkaloids. And from the leaf, the DMT. Now, the DMT is the endogenous visionary uh, entheogen. Now, the others are, well, they're all antidepressants, as well as some of them, two of them, on the left, are MAOIs, which they allow the DMT through the gut. So a lot of people focus on the really what the, the point of the vine is just to get the DMT through the gut. And what I'm saying is that's point number one, but it is also acting, they're all three of them are acting on the central nervous system as stimulants. Now, uh, tetrahydrohamine is acting on the nervous system, but doesn't do anything to DMT in the gut. But as I said, they all act on the nervous system. There's three main systems in the brain of neurotransmission. So there's a noradrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin systems. And what I'm saying is that the MAOIs will act on all the monoamines, which is all three of those systems, whereas the tetrahydrohamine only acts on the serotonin. Now, the different subspecies of vine have got different ratios of these three things in them. Also, when you cook the vine for a long time, like 24 hours, uh, then the harmine and harmine actually chemically change into tetrahydrohamine to some extent. So what I'm saying is vine subspecies and cooking duration will change the balance of effect on the central nervous system. So just Forget about DMT for a minute. I'm saying they're all having different qualitative uh, effects on the felt experience of the journey. Yeah? And for example, the tetrahydrohamine is the one that's doing the kind of heart opening thing. Yeah? Now, on to DMT. So DMT is, okay, good. I'm getting there, but. I've, this is complicated, so I'm probably going to go over a bit of time. Please bear with me. Serotonin and DMT are very similar. So both serotonin and DMT are endogenous, which means that whenever we eat protein, we take this thing called tryptophan from the protein, turn it into tryptamine, and from tryptamine, we naturally make either 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is commonly called serotonin, or N-N-dimethyltryptamine, which is DMT, right? So here's serotonin, this is what it looks like. And DMT, whoops, no, that's serotonin, that's what it looks like. 
and DMT is almost identical in structure. Yeah, serotonin, <coughs> DMT. Now what that means is they both fit into the same receptors in the brain. Now what are receptors? Receptors on neurons are, my analogy is like data ports on a computer. So over here, I have my USB keyboard plugged into my USB port with a USB shaped cable. And then over here, I've got my HDMI projector cable plugged into my HDMI shaped port, right? So different types of neurotransmitters, different molecules fit in, plug into different receptors in the brain, okay? Now, my favorite, and probably whether you know it or not, your favorite uh, receptor in the brain is the 5-HT2A receptor, okay? So I give it, and that's an analogy, a bit like a USB hub. So you've got over there on the right, you've got lots of USB devices plugged into a USB port. So they've all got the same USB cable, but within the computer they do a different thing. They have a different cascading effect inside the neuron. It's, it's like whether you plug a keyboard or a hard drive or an iPhone into a computer, it's going to do a different thing inside. Right? So what I'm saying is that DMT and serotonin both plug into the same 5-HT2A receptor. Now, it turns out that it's the same place where all the common psychedelics go. So serotonin, DMT, psilocybin from mushrooms, mescaline from cacti, and LSD from Hoffman all plug into the same receptor in the brain but these different agonists cause different cascading effects in neurons, okay? Now, the argument that the, you know, the experts say is that, well, we know that mescaline and LSD can trigger mania in bipolar people. And you know what? I agree with that. And uh, to, to a lesser extent, psilocybin, or if you have too much serotonin from taking Prozac, you can go manic as well. So everyone's saying, well, hey, DMT is an even more powerful hallucinogen than any of these things, so surely you're going to go manic if you take DMT. So, for example, in Draulio's study, I asked Draulio, can I participate in your study? No. I asked Ben Sessa, my PhD supervisor, can I participate in his LSD psychotherapy clinical trial going on at Imperial College? No. Chris Timmerman, DMT study at Imperial no, and everyone's answer is because, well, it's dangerous, right? Well, um, not in my experience, and this is why I think, this is my scientific explanation as to why I think that's the case, and thanks to Dave Nichols for inspiring this idea. So what happens is that these different molecules all are plugged into the receptor for a different duration. Now, the little simple molecules will plug in for a short amount of time, do their thing, and then leave. The big, complicated molecules, like LSD, they plug in, and they've got lots of arms, and they bind in lots of different places, and they lodged in there for a long time, like hours. And so what I'm saying is the escalation in mood has got to do with the duration of stimulation. So... Uh, so this is, these are just rough, very rough ideas, but what I'm saying is DMT is really short acting whereas the other psychedelics are in there for a long time and so that refutes the idea of why it would um, overstimulate. Now, so another thing is that I actually think that DMT is, works a bit like lithium on the phosphonositide cycle, which is the frequency modulations in the in the uh, cycle of phosphonositide in neurons are the, seem to be the underlying mechanism in bipolar disorder uh, of swings. And you know what? Lithium balances it, and DMT does something we don't know yet, but I'm guessing it does something like lithium. There's another story, which is the sigma-1 receptor, which is not understood what DMT does, but that's another story as well, which may elucidate things. So now, I'm nearly finished. I'm on a quest for an ideal ayahuasca brewing technique customized for people with bipolar disorder. So what I've been doing is collecting batches of tea that I've drunk 
and I've freeze-dried them, and I'm quantifying them. So, so far, I've only got four of them analyzed um, with fluorescent imaging. Uh, but basically, what I really want to do is take all these things, and I've got notes on them, uh, and I want to take about 25 or 30 samples and do proper liquid chromatography and, uh, and analyze them and, and then correlate the qualitative experience of that batch of tea with graphs of the ingredients. And what I think is going to come up, what I'm going to come up with, I think, is, you know, an ideal way of making the tea with the right vine and the right technique and so on. Combining that with the uh, right set and setting that I'm getting from the interviews, and I think that we're on to a therapeutic potential for people with bipolar disorder that not only does not ruin their spirituality and creativity, but enhances it. And that's what I'd like to see. At the end of the day, I'd like this to go to clinical trials. So here's some anecdotes. Anyone can help me with funding. I need to get, to get these experiments done. Please talk to me. If you want summaries of these quotes, contacts, uh, safety mechanisms, and all that stuff, that's all here. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>